So I will be keeping an eye on um, the waiting room in case anyone comes in late, but we can get started. Welcome everybody to lesson one of the FarmStand business curriculum. Um, today we'll be talking about food systems. My name is Sophia Leon. I am the nutrition education coordinator um, at the School Gardens program here at Grow NYC. Um, so to get started, we'll talk a little bit first about Grow NYC, what we do. Um, I know many of you are aware of what we do so far, but uh, we work in four different areas, including conservation, education, green spaces, and food ac access and agriculture. And our work makes it easier for, for you to have a positive impact in these uh, different ways regarding environmentalism in the city. So before we get started with the presentation, we want to go over community agreements. And these were, um, I know, agreed upon between all uh, the students and the staff here um, in the workforce development program. So I'm just going to read them out. And if we have any, um, anyone wants to agree or add new community agreements in the chat um, that we can discuss, uh, feel free to do so. So first of all, we have step up and step back. We have trust intention, but acknowledge impact. Understand and respect boundaries, both physical and verbal. Be clear and honest in your communication. Speak up or reach out. Having a mutual understanding of the importance of taking breaks, especially on Zoom. I know that that can, you know, sometimes be a lot to be on Zoom for a long period of time, um, being open-minded and understanding, listening to speakers, even if you don't agree, acknowledging the strength of others and working collaboratively, uh, no hierarchy in terms of ages and position to respect one, one another, and to offer reciprocal feedback to make sure we are meeting each other's expectations. And so for our tech-specific community agreements, um, we would like you to please keep your microphone muted unless you're speaking to reduce background noise. If possible, please turn on your video, um, especially when you're speaking. We want to connect with you. And you know, as a facilitator, if you've ever facilitated Zoom, you know that it's really hard to tell how you're doing unless people have their video on. Um, to use the chat for your thoughts, responses, and questions, uh, please respond to and challenge ideas, not people. Respect the visual space. And we are recording this event. And if you're uncomfortable with that, you can keep your video off. But we're recording. And I mentioned earlier, we will be posting this um, to your Google Classroom to be able to have access to it in the future. So before we get started with the content for today, I am first going to share a uh, clip of the Crown Heights farm stand in the news. Some of you might have seen this already. This aired last week, I believe on July 24th, um, and it's very exciting. And let me know if you can't see or hear what comes up. Celebrating success, our stories, our voices, Positively Black. Well, as redevelopment continues to alter some New York City communities, some of them are left with no options for fresh produce. That's right, and that's where the Grow NYC farm stands step in. Here's Weekend Today in New York's Jen Maxfield with today's Positively Black. Every Friday, fresh produce is on the menu at the Grow NYC farm stand in Crown Heights. Oh, they're looking fresh, so I'm trying to get some. This is a nice bunch of kale, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this farm stand opened in response to the closure of the Associated Market on Nostrand Avenue last year to make way for new development, leaving neighbors scrambling for new sources of fresh food. People are going to have to walk distances uh, to go get food for their family. If you're talking about a family of four, a family of five, you know, that's a lot of food to have to carry. You know, what are you supposed to do if you're a senior? Everybody wants to feed their families. They want to make sure that they all have access to, like, healthy foods. Everybody knows 
how to do that, but sometimes it's actually being able to buy that. Ten dollars plus fourteen is going to be twenty-four dollars. The Grow NYC farm stand in Crown Heights is one of 14 throughout the city and one of the only ones open year round. The produce that Grow NYC sells also supports local farmers. In fact, all of the vegetables that you see here and the other food products were produced in New York State, less than 200 miles from here. Being conscious consumers and seeing, especially when it comes to food, and seeing uh, who we're supporting, how we're supporting it, and where we're putting our money and time. Grow NYC also employs young people, teaching them everything from writing resumes to learning about future careers in the food industry. Food is a really big part of my culture, and it is for a lot of people and minority groups. So um, to bring that into communities and share just food, I think, is a really big thing. In Crown Heights, I'm Jen Maxfield for Weekend Today in New York. And you can catch these positively black stories every week right here on... Great. So obviously we all know that the work we're doing is super important, but I think it's it's amazing to see it being recognized in the news and just by the whole community and, you know, everyone recognizing how important it is what we're doing. And shout out to everyone that was in that featured in that video and everyone in this program in general. Um, you know, you're on NBC and you're also being featured all over the city. I'm trying to share my screen. Okay, so for today's lesson, we will be talking about five different questions we should be able to answer by the end of um, the lesson. And so our five questions include, what is a food system? What happens at each step of the food system? What is food access? What is food security? And we will briefly touch on how does New York City's food system work? Uh, this question you'll be going into much greater detail later in the curriculum. So we'll just begin to discuss it today. And for everyone that uh, just came in, my name is Sophia. I am uh, um, I am Nutrition Education Coordinator here at Grown IC. I work in the School Gardens Program, um, and I'm working with Tutu on these presentations, and I'm super excited to be working with you all uh, this afternoon. I'm just going to escape out real quick so that I can share my screen without this disruption. All right. Okay, so for what is a food system, uh, the very general definition of what a food system is involves a life cycle of steps and processes around the production, processing, transport, and consumption of food. And you can see on this diagram here on the right that that includes food production, processing, distribution, retail and market, consumption and waste recovery. And for those asking, will we be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint slides? Yes, um, a copy of the slides and the presentation itself will be posted um, online after this presentation. And so a fair and just food system includes stakeholders in decision-making at each level. You may be wondering, um, what are stakeholders or who are the stakeholders in a food system? A stakeholder is a person who provides services, support, resources, or ideas for a community, organization, project, or industry within a system. So a stakeholder is someone who uh, has a stake in the outcome of the system because they're part of the system. So for example, a stakeholder might be an employee um, or a member of a community that cares about whether or not a business uh, succeeds or fails because that business impacts them. So we're going to watch a short video about stakeholders in a food system. A 
food system is the natural and economic structure that allows a community to feed itself. And that starts everywhere from the farmers to the distributors to the retailers all the way to the consumer. It's this invisible network of relationships. A lot of times people think of the food system as just a farmer or a grocer, etc. But it's really about the relationships or when a food system is unhealthy, the lack there of the food system is about how are we relating to the natural system as well. And then you've got the social aspects, groups in the community that are working very hard on hunger relief issues. It's an incredibly complex system and it's become more and more complex. Essentially it comes down to how do you get food from off of a piece of ground onto someone's plate. Great, so that video showed in, it was based I think in Northern California, but um, the ideas of what a food system are, especially the different stakeholders, um, as I mentioned, people who have an interest in the outcome of the system are the same, um, whether the food system is in New York or California or anywhere in the world, the idea of the food system is the same. So although we now know what food systems are, there are many different types of food systems, which is what we will be starting to discuss today. Um, so we will be talking about local food systems and regional food systems. So we'll be watching another video um, and afterwards we will uh, discuss these three questions, which are what are the different types of local food systems? Why would a farmer or a producer opt for one of these types over, over the other? And what are some apparent challenges to the farmer and consumer? A local What is a local food system? Often, when we think of local food, we think of a farmer bringing their product to market and selling directly to consumers. This part of the local food system involves a lot of time and energy on the part of the farmer to market and distribute their products by creating a brand and customer base, answering emails, building websites, and educating consumers about their local food and non-food products. Examples of direct sales include Community Supported Agriculture, or CSAs, Farmers Markets, Roadside Stands, On-Farm Markets, and Online Sales and Pickups. Some farmers really enjoy selling directly to consumers and educating people about the food they grow. Other farmers are more interested in being out on their farm, raising food for a fair price, and making a living at what they love to do. In many communities, demand for local food can be greater than supply, leaving many customers frustrated at the lack of availability of local food. A local food system is where consumers can buy locally grown food through many intermediated channels. How does it work? The farmer grows and raises the local food, ensuring their practices are safe and compliant. Their farm products can then be moved and sold through a number of intermediated channels. Some farmers distribute their food through a food hub or aggregation site where many farmers bring their product to collectively market and distribute to larger buyers such as hospitals, food banks, or universities. Some farmers sell their food to a processor or food entrepreneur who creates a processed product such as jam, frozen vegetables, meat cuts, or cheese. Some farmers develop relationships with local chefs, grocers, or schools and grow the food they need to serve or sell to their customers. Local food systems create communities of customers who are proud and committed to local food farmers. A local food system that moves beyond the farmers market and creates multiple channels for distribution and access by customers will ensure that our farmers have reliable, long-term demand for their products and the infrastructure to make it happen.
All right, so we learned about what a local food system is. So I would love to hear from some people. You can unmute yourselves and uh, answer any of our, our three questions, but let's start out with what are some different types of local food systems? Does anyone want to unmute themselves and uh, take a stab at it? Yes, uh, Unity, and let me know um, if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. Oh, yeah, wait, sorry. Um... Wait, does my mic work? Mm -hmm. Sorry. Oh, okay. All right, sorry. I thought it wasn't. Um. Okay, so um one of them was partnering with restaurants and local businesses which i i thought was pretty cool because i remember in our first day of training um when you mentioned how um the green market in union square like a lot of uh rest what are they restauranteurs or restaurant owners mm -hmm. um they come and they buy a lot of their products and things that they use for the restaurant they make like a huge purchase like to buy these like wholesale farm products which I thought was pretty cool but um I didn't know that it could be um sort of it goes directly to them like they buy it and then it gets shipped to them or like a truck comes over and gives them the food and everything um yeah that's pretty cool yes thank you that is that is one of the uh types of local food systems mentioned in this video. Um, I think the name for it was um, Food Hub for that. Um, and that is very true. And it's super interesting to see, um, especially at Union Square, the um, our largest green market, there are definitely a lot of chefs or rest restaurateurs um, that show up making a big order for their restaurant. Does anyone else um, have an idea of one of the other types of local food systems mentioned in the video. Or um, why a farmer would opt for uh, going one route versus the other for how they're going to sell their produce or who they're going to sell to. And the types of uh, local food systems discussed were kind of just different avenues or different people that they would choose to sell to, different groups. Um, so that can be another way to think about it. And this goes along with some of the challenges that the farmers uh, face in terms of what they want to spend their time doing. That is kind of a hint. Yes, farm stand. Um, I think I remember the... Uh... The options being the farmers who want direct um, relationships with their consumers, and then um, there are those who would rather spend um, their time growing food and um, having a steady and fair, a fair price for their food, but also just having a steady um, form of income because they have that guaranteed order from a larger um, wholesale entity. Yes, so the different types of food systems discussed in the video um, were food hubs, which include selling to a uh, large organizations such as universities or businesses, uh, hospitals, um, selling to processors, um, which can be making processed foods such as making jam from strawberries or making processed meat cuts 
um, from local meat, and then direct to consumer at markets. And this is what people typically think of when they think of a local food system um, is selling at farmers markets, but it's important to remember that local food is everywhere. There's many different um, avenues in which it is sold. So we can move system. on to a definition of a local food system, which is a collaborative network that supports sustainable food production, processing, distribution, consumption, and waste management. And it's important to remember that it includes farms of all sizes, a diverse range of foods, fibers, and practices. It maximizes productivity and it minimizes environmental damage. Also, local food systems involve stakeholders in your direct community and aims to feed community members. Um, in New York City, a local food system could be made up of neighborhoods even within boroughs. So for example, within the uh, borough of Brooklyn, Bed-Stuy is its own local food system as would be any neighborhood within the borough. So that can really show how uh, micro it can get, especially within New York City. And some benefits of a local food system are that it works with nature, it avoids damaging the natural environment without sacrificing productivity or profitability. So if we remember all of the ways I just mentioned earlier about uh, avenues in which they can sell their produce or uh, their product, um, local food systems pr promote an economic resiliency, diversified farming and medicines centered around culture and cultural integration. Um, and they encourage cooperation from larger industries through community cooperation, market investment, and public demand. So now that we've discussed local food systems and learned all about them, we are going to talk about regional food systems. So regional food systems, um, as you can see on this graph here on the left, uh, are one level up in scale from local food systems, and they consist of multiple marketing and distributing options for farms of all sizes. Um, so we have a local food system here, example being a farmer's market or local hunting and fishing, while a regional food system includes most supermarket and restaurant foods. And New York City's food system, regional food system, includes neighboring states such as New Jersey, Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont, and Pennsylvania. And then this is one level below a global food system, um, which includes uh, produce and products from all over the globe. And so now that we know kind of the difference between a local and regional food system, which uh, can also be inferred from the name, um, we're going to talk about what happens at each step of the food system. So we have food production, which is also known as farming, and it is the growth of plants or animal products for human consumption. And this is kind of the first step of any food system, it's actually growing the food. Then we have processing, which would be a series of mechanical or chemical operations in order to change or preserve goods. Distribution is next, which is getting goods from the production and processing stage to other businesses that will then sell them to consumers. We have retail and market, which is the selling of goods directly to the public at retail price. And retail price just means the price that the consumer buys it at. So the final price um, of the product on the shelf in the store. Uh, we have consumption, which is to fully use and dispose of the resources, eating, and waste recovery, which is diverting and reducing quantities of waste through various channels, including eco-friendly packaging, recycling, composting, um, and other waste recovery efforts. Our next question that we're going to tackle today is what is food access? And food access, generally means having the ability to get good food. 
Also, we are going to have plenty of time for questions at the end. I know that we're going over a lot of material today. Um, so we're just going to get through it and we'll have a lot of time for questions and um, some activities at the end of the presentation. So food access is the ability to get good food. Good food being nutritious, high quality, affordable, and culturally relevant. Access to good food is a human right. Um, according to the UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, the right to adequate food is realized when every man, woman, and child, alone or in community with others, has physical and economic access at all times to adequate food or means for its procurement. However, millions of people in the US and around the world don't have access, which is why learning about uh, food ac access in agriculture and participating in programs um, such as these are so important for increasing food access around the world and in your own communities. Food access points are a place where you can get nutritious, high quality, and affordable food. Um, some examples of food access points, and this is not an exhaustive list, um, but just some um, more common ones could be grocery stores, food carts, restaurants, farmers markets, community gardens, bodegas or corner stores, or food pantries. And if you can think of any other food access points that we don't have listed here, definitely drop them in the chat. Um, it is an ever expanding list. And so we have our next question being what is food security? And according to the US Department of Agriculture or the USDA, uh, food security is when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious, nutritious food to meet their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life and affects people through both under and over consumption. So that might seem like a lot of words in a row. Um, so we kind of broke it down into being food security requires food to always be available, accessible, and able to be utilized. And so it's these three points and they have to be stable at all times uh, to have a full range of food security. On the flip side, what is food insecurity? So according to the Food and Agriculture Organization, which is uh, part of the, United, uh, the UN, uh, the definition of food insecurity is a, per a person is food insecure when they lack regular access to enough safe and nutritious food for normal growth and development in an active and healthy life. And this also is kind of a broad definition. So we have broken it down into um, different kind of ranges of food insecurity. And of course, this is also not exhaustive. And there are many places that people or communities or groups can fall um, within the range of food insecurity. So it's important to keep that in mind um, when thinking about food security versus food insecurity. It's not necessarily black or white, um, everything within it um, can, there's different levels within both food insecurity and food security. So we have mild food insecurity, which is, could be worrying about the ability to obtain food, moderate food insecurity being compromising quality and variety of food or reducing quantities or skipping meals, um, and severe food insecurity um, going more into the category of experiencing hunger. And these are all um, on the spectrum of food insecurity. So the last kind of big topic we might, are gonna cover a bit today is New York City's food system. And like I said earlier, later in your uh, curriculum, you're going to go much more in detail with New York City's food system. So, I won't go too deep into it today because it is quite complicated, but just like everything in New York, it's big, it's complex, um, it's a bit of a headache, just kidding, but it's a complex network of transportation, distribution, and retail. Um, most of New York City's food is initially 
transported to regional distribution centers. Um, for example, we have Hunts Point Terminal Produce Market in the Bronx, um, which receives a large amount of the food that goes out then to other entities in the city, such as restaurants, um, schools, hospitals, et cetera. And most of the food originates from the south of New York State um, before coming to New York City and then going all around the city. And New York City's food system feeds over 8 million residents of the city, tens of thousands of restaurants, almost 2,000 public schools, numerous hospitals, and dozens of farmers markets, and 19 billion pounds of food enters New York City annually, which is definitely too big of a number to fully grasp. So before we move on to a activity, I would love to take any questions, comments, um, about what we've uh, talked about today, which as I know has been a lot of different topics. So anything about food systems, whether it be local food systems, regional food systems, food insecurity, food security, food access, and feel free to drop it in the chat or unmute yourself. So does that food include frozen and preserved foods? Um, so I'm assuming you're talking about um, the food that enters New York City Yes. Um, so 19 millions. Yeah, so that that includes food that enters New York City going. Um, Sophia? Yeah. Oh, that, that statistic is actually just, um, I think it's uh, food that grows on a farm. So like food in its natural state. So mostly okay. fruits and vegetables. Yep, so no, it does not include frozen and preserved foods. So with that, it would be even even more. Is it only local? I so I don't think, no, it's yeah. it's that not only cool. local food entering New York City, the 19 million pounds. Yes, great questions. I agree. Any more questions that have come up right now before we move into the activity? Otherwise, we can continue um, to take questions uh, after the activity. All right. Sophia, I think you're missing John. His hand is up. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. What Hi. Is Hi. Uh, there was a process in there about processing food. And I thought we were trying to get away from processing or having food processed. Yeah, so we were discussing uh, the different parts of a food system and processing is part of that food system. Um, something about processing is it can be as little as maybe, you know, turning pollen into honey so that's that's processing but also oh, wow. um turning strawberries into jam or a more processed food could be you okay, know having meat and eventually making it into a chili cheese a hamburger yeah. so it's okay. processing is a kind of vague term um that in incorporates lots of different things there are less processed foods and more processed foods um but it definitely is still part of the food system Oh, okay, because I no, thought thank you for your chemicals, question. chemicals and I was like freaking out a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so it sometimes it does involve adding chemicals and some more than others. Um, but that's actually a good lead in to uh, our activity for our breakout rooms, um, which is that once I separate you all into breakout rooms of a couple of uh, folks, um, we are going to, as a group, you'll think of a food or food product that you consume regularly. And this could be anything from an apple to a bag of chips. Um, and you will use our food system chart, um, which we have all the stages at 
at the bottom here, which are food production, processing, distribution, retail and market, consumption, and waste recovery to understand how your food travels through each stage of the food system process. And I will put the link to um, this Jamboard in the chat. Um, I think that you've all used Jamboard before. Um, so hopefully at least one person in your breakout room will have used the Jamboard before, but a brief tutorial, um, if you're, and your breakout room number will correspond to the group you're in. So here, if you're in breakout room number one, you're in group one, and you would, add, you can add sticky notes um, with content on them for the different parts of the food system. Um, so I will separate you into breakout rooms and within your breakout room, you can choose a food product um, and then map it out with the process starting from food production and um, going to waste recovery. Before I separate you into breakout rooms, do, do people have questions about this activity? So you'll be brainstorming about um, how your food product flows through the food system on this Jamboard. So I will put the link in the chat now. And I will start separating you into breakout rooms. All right, so I'm about to open the rooms, um, so we should get started with this. We'll have about 10 minutes in the breakout room, and then we'll come back and share out. So someone in the room, in each room, can um, be prepared to share out when we come back. I just wanted to comment, too, before we go off, is that mm -hmm. on the top of the page is how you can scroll through for the different groups. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Winnie. Yeah. Thank you, Sophia. Great, so everyone is making their way back to our main room. Um, so we will be wrapping up shortly, but uh, before we wrap up, um, I would love to hear um, one person from each of our groups share out and I will go over to the Jamboard. Can everybody see the Jamboard? Yep. Um, and I know maybe not everyone was able to uh, get everything on the Jamboard, but just maybe uh, tell us a little bit about what you were discussing in your group. Um, so can someone from group one please unmute themselves and uh, tell us all about what we can see here on the board? Yeah, so uh, we chose a food that I eat a lot, which is peanut butter. Um, and so yeah, we just, I quickly like looked up how peanut butter is made. Um, and found out that first after it's planted and harvested, they shell it um, and process it. Then they dry roast all the peanuts and then they grind the peanuts into the peanut butter. Then they cool it and blanch it. Then they package it and distribute it. Then I buy it at the store and I eat it. <laughs> and then I recycle the bottle. Awesome. Are there any specific uh, ways you like to eat peanut butter in the consuming process? I like eating peanut butter with dates or with bananas or with oatmeal. Yum. <laughs> That's great. Well, thank you so much for the detailed uh, research on the fly. That's great. And the amazing drawings. 
This is this That's is great. all you need. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we can move on to group two. Can we get a volunteer from group two, please? Yeah. So when I was doing this, I just thought about like when with my group, like what do we eat all all the time, and I just thought about bread and how our food production of bread is. It's quite simple. It's just bread is water, yeast, salt. So production the farmer grows the wheat and then the processing the wheat gets processed into flour and then it also goes to another process of like turning the flour into bread and then it gets distributed and then in the distribute distribute and then the bread gets distributed like sent out to markets to sell to the consumers and then retailers are marketing will package the bread and like identify the customers like just like sell it to our customers and then the consumption is just we just eat the bread and then waste i don't i can't really think of anything on top of my head of how to do the waste but i guess like composting for most people but i usually just eat everything or just toss it in the fridge and eat it later yeah great thank you so much oscar this is um awesome bread is definitely probably one of the most highly consumed foods and I'm just guessing there but um definitely in the U.S. at least uh and did you were, was there any part of the bread uh food system that was surprising to you to think about mm, I guess like when it comes to like more locally grown bread like real bread like when I was in the farm set, I kind of read the ingredients it's like not that much ingredients like it's just quite simple while like other types of bread like mark like supermarket bread it's like it has a lot of like ingredients and you know that's i i, I probably get lost like reading all the ingredients so yeah definitely more um in the processing um category there thank you so much that was a great example of a food system so next group number three can we get a volunteer, please? Hello. Um, Hello. I'm a volunteer for group number three. All right. So, um, well, this is mine. Oh, it was me, Elizabeth, and, um, yeah. Sorry. Me, um, Isabel, and John. So, it was somebody else in there, but I, for, I forgot. I don't remember. But, so, basically, we did Snapples. So, it's like I'm a big fan of Snapple. Yeah. So so we chose um banana snapple, which is like my favorite one. Yeah. Nobody actually likes it but me. But banana is grown and is picked on a farm by by a worker. And then after that, bananas aren't grown locally. So they are collected and transported somewhere else to be yeah, banana snapple. Yes, it's a thing. Yes. Um, and transported somewhere else to be processed. And we looked up the Snapple and it's based in Texas where we think the bananas are processed and bottled and and they're and they're contained in they're contained in plastic bottles now. Before it was contained in glass bottles, which was bad for the environment. So now that's plastic, which is still bad, but it's not as bad as glass. Um, and then the bottles are sent to the regional hub, and the bottles are distributed in the in the storage like BJ's, and and then it's given out to the people in our neighborhood. And I think, and it creates a business and trust for farmers and wholesale providers, which increase profit over time. And to think of food, and to think of food or food products that you consume regularly was the question anything from an apple to a bag of chips use wait sorry anything for a bag of chips use the food system chart to understand how your tr food travels to state of the food system process map yeah that's that was the question so yeah great thank you so much josiah um i've never seen a banana snapple but now i'm really interested I've seen, you know, all the other types of Snapple, um, but that was great. Again, thanks again for the research on the fly. I didn't know Snapple was based in Texas either. 
Um, and I like how all the different groups have been choosing really different foods. Um, so we're really getting into how different the food system is for each of these different foods we eat. And these are just three that we chose. Um, and we're, <laughs> okay, banana snapple sounds sus, interesting comment. <laughs> I don't know about that. Rain snapple might also sound sus. But by by talking about and thinking about these really different foods, we're getting into how different each of these processes might be very sus to do. Okay, I think we have just one more group. Um, if I, yes, we just have one more group. Um, so can someone from group four please um, volunteer to tell us all about your food system? Beta, do you want to represent us since you chose that lowly dish? Um, so for group four, we chose salmon and rice. So we broke it down with salmon and we broke it down with the full process for rice. For salmon, the fisherman catches the fish. Then for the process, it's gutters, cleans, and, fill and fillets the fish. And then the next process is the middleman between the fisherman and the supermarket. Then it gets to the consumer and people purchase the salmon. Then the consumer grills and eats the salmon. And then there's a possibility that the bones and the heads of the food, the heads go to food composting. So for the second process, which is rice, um, we buy the rice seed, plant the seed, water, and harvest the crop, dry rice plant, and thresh and widow until the into remove edible part, then send the rice to the middleman and the distributor. Then it goes to the consumer. So the consumer buys the rice from the supermarket. The consumer cooks and eats the rice. Then um, we were kind of confused with the last part. So that's why there's a question where does the, um, we didn't know um, how the, the process of where the rice, how the rice ends up to the consumer or like the supermarket. So that's why there's a question there. Great, thank you, Jada. I, I don't know if you did this on purpose, but I do love how um, you have the pink sticky notes for the salmon um, because it's salmon. That's salmon winning. Salmon pink. <laughs> <laughs> and the rice isn't green, but the the crop is green. So, um, but yeah, that, those are, it, it, once again, I love the variety of um, products we've all chosen. Um, I like how with this one, we have salmon and rice. So it's showing that even when you have a food with the more and more ingredients, each of those um, ingredients has its own process. So it just is compounding on all the steps um, in, in getting your food onto your plate. So before we wrap up for the day, um, firstly, I would love to thank all of you again. These seemed like really great conversations we had in our breakout rooms um, and just learning all about these food systems. And does anybody uh, have any comments or further questions for me or anyone in the room before we wrap up? Winnie, I mean, Sophia? Yes. Hi, uh, I just wanted to say it was great to see all these young people coming up with these ideas. Um, I'm John Reddick. I'm actually a founding board member for Harlem Link Charter School, and I spent 25 years working for Trust for Public Land. I also sit on the Manhattan Land Trust with 14 community gardens. And to see young people interested in community gardens and wanting to know and follow this cycle is really, really great. Guys, please keep it up because us older people, we're getting too old to do it. <laughs> and we need you younger people. Uh, it's really important and it's a great living. I've been doing it over 50 years. Um, it's a great way to help mother nature, also to educate others. And I just wanna say, please keep up the good work. And if there's any way I can help out at particular times, let me know because it's my dedication to, because somebody did it for me, 
I want to pass it on. I also work with uh, Brotherhood and Sister Soul. If you know that organization, Nando is my old student who's the education and environmental coordinator there. Okay, so keep up the good work. Thank you so much. No, thank you. Um, as uh, Tiju just said in the chat, we love Brotherhood and Sister Soul. Um, and thank you so much for our, the partnership over the years and for attending our workshop today. Thanks for joining. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I'm gonna try and come in from now on, especially since I can do Zoom, so I can be in two places at times. <laughs> thank you, Sophia. Thank you. Okay, so that, that's gonna be all for today. This was being recorded, so it will be um, up on the Google Classroom.